Um, so, buongiorno. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to join this um, amazing event. It's, been a, it's a real, been a real honor and a privilege to be here for the last few days. Uh, today I want to talk about architectural well-being in the senses, and I was thinking about um, Claudio's talk on synesthesia and how there were certainly some uh, crossovers in our discussions for today. So I want to begin with the proposition that architects have always known that the places we shape influence human experience and hence physical and psychological states. Yet only recently has the phrase design and health returned to mainstream architectural discourse. Not since modernism's fascination with sanitation and human health has this concept explicitly appeared in so many publications and projects. Unlike early 20th century concerns, however, current architectural discussions around health include ideas about physical, mental, and social well-being, from the individual to the planetary scale. Disciplines as diverse as medicine, architecture, economics, and anthropology are examining how the constructed environment can promote well-being. Universities and sustainability assessment and professional groups, um, such as LEED, BREAM, the American Institute of Architects, and others, are really taking a leading role in architectural discussions and evidence-based research connecting public health and architecture. Yet the vital connection between the built environment and human health is often underestimated. In architectural discourse, the phrase design and health is often narrowly linked with just healthcare facilities, uh, which of course is an important aspect, but not the full story. So a visitor to the AIA um, knowledge community website for the Academy of Architecture for Health might rightly assume that health for architects is limited to the design of medical facilities. And I would like to uh, make the proposition that what about all the other areas where design intersects health and well-being? from sustainable urban design to environmental justice to all forms of aesthetic delight and beauty. So this example uh, from the website indicates the clear positioning needed for universities to become central to research, practice, and public discussions of design and health. At a recent summit in the United States, the U.S. Surgeon General Boris Lushniak explained, and I just wanted to quote him. Oh, sorry, I'm going to slide behind here. Health needs to be part of the design and planning language and a natural aspect of the process, so that in asking, what are we building, we are also asking, what's the impact on the community's health? And what's the impact on individual health? In reference to the World Health Organization's three facets of health, physical, mental, and social well-being, Lushniak insists that the largely unmeasurable facets of mental health and social well-being are essential considerations for architecture, and that's really the kind of what I want to focus on today. I would also um, argue that by building on current sustainability theories that link equity, economy, and environment, design and health efforts can develop a holistic agenda that will reach a broader constituency and create more healthy places. So let's examine some, exa uh, some examples of spatial, formal, and material strategies that are used in contemporary and traditional architecture to promote all three facets of health through the bodily senses. Uh, the ability of architecture to encourage reflection and even contemplation is an important part of this larger discussion. Resource, research from several disciplines has proven that designed environments can help to relieve the stress of contemporary life and that sensory awareness and mindfulness can positively influence human health. While there are skeptics, it's time that we acknowledge architecture's important role. I wanted to um, draw on a quote from architectural theorist Johanny Palasma to frame my discussion today. Palasma writes, the real purpose of architecture is not to create aestheticized objects or spaces, but to provide frames, horizons, and settings for experiencing and understanding the world, and finally, ourselves. So I, drawing on this, I'd like to propose two questions that we might ponder today, and I'm sorry, these are kind of small. Um, what design strategies can effectively promote health and well-being in architecture? And what approaches might connect us with self, community, and even the vastness of our world? Now, there are many ways that we could discuss this, and I'm just going to focus on three concepts that I think can be particularly helpful. The concept of interiority, of the framing of nature, and of either heightened or reduced sensory qualities. And these include the tactile, aural, and other uh, visual qualities. 
Now, along with architecture designed to support rituals, such as churches and temples and, and so forth, there are powerful secular places, uh, such as this thermal bath by Peter Zumthor, which are able to disrupt habitual thought and blase attitudes to deepen awareness of place and even foster reflection. Such environments go beyond supporting human need to fill our emotional, intellectual, and spiritual aspirations. Of course, we know that heightened awareness is dormant for many today. Our senses are bombarded with relentless and aggressive media images, ever-present traffic noise, and uniformly lit fluorescent spaces that disconnect us from the diurnal cycle. And we heard about that in, um, in a few previous talks. Our homes, offices, and hospitals certainly need not be this way. Architecture designed for health can ameliorate these conditions and increase awareness. I think we're all familiar with places that can achieve such an effect. For instance, think of architect Le Corbusier's chapel at Ronchamp, where um, he describes his design intentions in this way. I wanted to create a place of silence, of prayer, of peace, and of eternal joy. Now, this is a, a, a Christian church, but I would argue that creating a place for internal joy is really a good goal for any building and needn't be um, limited to this type of um, sacred space. Uh, drawing on the essay on the transcendent in landscapes of contemplation, Heinrich Hermann discussed three paradigms for how a contemplative state may be elicited by an environment. In her, his first paradigm, he talks about this perceptual linkage between each individual and the cosmos, or that thing beyond ourselves, well, whatever word we want to use to describe that. Uh, for instance, uh, Lewis Kahn's Salk Institute, I think, is a good example. Uh, this is a medical research building. What well, could have been a banal um, uh, lab building amidst a sea of parking is a place that draws people into a relationship with the sea and the sky beyond. It's even a place where people come to celebrate marriages and other significant events at a medical laboratory building. In the second paradigm uh, that I'd like to discuss, there's this idea of an inwardly oriented space which creates a sense of sanctuary or refuge. And then the third, um, the idea of employing archetypal cultural symbols, um, which vary, of course, between cultures, in this case, a stupa in India, or we could look at the, look at the rotunda at the University of Virginia, um, functioning much in the same way. So we're attaching our, um, a whole set of memories and ideas to these forms as we see them in space. Now, the first of these, heightened sensory awareness, can be induced through the inward orientation of a space, this quality of interiority. We find powerful examples across continents, cultures, and time. This 600-year-old Jain temple in India at Ranikpur possesses a powerful kind of interiority while framing and connecting us to the landscape beyond. The, the, um, the, this is the exterior of the temple. It's a kind of fortress-like exterior that shelters this very light-infused um, inner sanctuary, a place of both refuge and prospect um, to, the, to the world beyond. Now, it's interesting when we look at this space, the floors, walls, columns, and ceilings are all white marble. It's a monochromatic space. And this singular material palette could have been monotonous, but all surfaces are higher, hardly articulated with a rich carving, which is a kind of intense but uh, calming sort of tactility that pervades the visitor's experience to this space. Uh, another example, I don't know, I'm just showing you some examples from the, around the world to think of how we um, pursue these issues. This is a dormitory hall at a Buddhist temple, uh, Horyuji, in Japan, where this is another kind of internalized space of columns and beams with a consistent material palette as well, in this case wood rather than stone. And we see translucent shoji screens around the perimeter that increase the interior focus of the space while kind of mysteriously illuminating um, the exterior beyond, but denying a view or a direct connection with that space. Now, these kinds of um, approaches we can find in contemporary buildings as well, uh, and, and, and we do. Um, here's an example of a, um, a, a Mandela Zen Center in New Mexico in the United States, where architects Pradoc Frayne used long-span wood construction to create a new um, meeting hall that employs similar strategies for quieting a space. Um, interior, interiority is reinforced with a kind of limited material palette, with, palette, with geometric clarity, uh, with luminous walls, with a central focus. Um, 
At the same time, a very simple, uh, unassuming exterior with broad eaves, natural materials, um, translates a traditional Buddhist temple, but in a very um, abstract kind of way. And we find that um, materials such as heavy rammed earth, which are specific to that place, and we've heard a lot about where materials come from, I think, over the course of this um, conference, uh, rooted to New Mexico, but at the same time refer to um, Asian traditions beyond. And then I think finally this idea of um, light and how light can be managed um, in a very direct kind of framing of view, but also in this way of creating a, a kind of ethereal condition beyond. And now I just wanted to show you one more example of this argu argument about interiority, which is a, a recent um, project in, uh, at Northeastern University in Boston, which is an interfaith um, chapel or meeting space, uh, which can be configured in different ways for different groups. But, but essentially, it's in the middle of a really banal academic building. But through the use of um, light and uh, specific materials, is able to create a contemplative um, environment. Here's another example. So there, this room is, has no access to natural light, but it's able to, in some way, connect us, I would argue, to, well, maybe uh, largely through this also small oculus, to the notion of the world beyond um, ourselves in this space. Um, we see a lot of oculi in Italy, and so I wanted to kind of talk about these oculi hole in the ceilings, like in the Pantheon, um, where we have oculi, windows, apertures, other ways of framing the exterior world, whether that's the sky or the view of a landscape beyond. These are two examples of recent um, uh, medical facilities. One is a Maggie's Center. Uh, this is a one space within that designed by architect Rem Kohlhaus, and another one in um, Scandinavia, which also uses both uh, views beyond the forested landscape, but also this kind of uh, ephemeral quality of bringing light in from above through um, oculi and different kinds of apertures. Of course, there are many ways to uh, modulate light, and we might think to examples from around the world, uh, both historically and in the present, things like the carved jolly screens in Mughal architecture which are a way to dematerialize a massive heavy wall but still maintain um, interiority uh, but connect us to the world beyond. Or um, museums are another really ex interesting example. This is the uh, view of the Columba Museum in Köln, Germany by Swiss architect Peter Zumthor. And I would argue that in many ways the best museums are also in places of inspiration and sometimes powerful places that promote well-being, um, that remove us from the kind of uh, troubles of daily life in some way. I wanted then to show you a few more examples that are specifically um, medical or contemplative focused. This is a recent project at Stanford University in California called the Windover Contemplative Center, which is really designed to frame views, this idea of um, how we connect ourselves to what lies beyond as we're in an internal space. And the, the university um, on their website talks about the mission of the center as, quote, a spiritual refuge on the Stanford campus meant to both inspire and to promote personal renewal. Here in the midst of Silicon Valley is a device-free space, filled with light, the touch of nature, and incredible art, where we each have the opportunity to be still, to open ourselves to silence, to ponder, to walk the labyrinth. This is not a place for heavy programming of activity. It's a place to be. Here, mind can connect with body, spirit, and heart. Uh, the building was designed to, to house a series of paintings, and this also, I think, talks about the healing power of art, be it music or visual arts and other art forms, as a kind of um, art as a, as a window to another world beyond. And also, we can think about landscape functioning that, in that way as well, such as this reflection pool where we see the sky um, and we're enclosed by this um, sculptural wall in the space. I think the other thing that this, this project, the Windover project, demonstrates is that courtyards can be a really important strategy to create oases in the midst of a bustling city uh, or building. And we've seen some really great examples of courtile and courtyard spaces um, today. Uh, here's an example. Well, does everyone remember this? That's where some of us were um, in Padova the other day, Palazzo Bo. Um, this is a Maggie Center, which is uh, designed by architect Rem Kohlhaus. And it is also employing that same strategy of a sheltered internal space to, um, as a place of renewal, as a place of health and well-being, a place of calmness. The, um, 
So I, I guess I'm arguing for also the kind of spatial uh, protection of spaces like this in buildings. And I wanted to show you a few examples of other contemporary um, healthcare facilities that work in this way. This is a, a cancer counseling center in Denmark that also creates, I don't know if you can see this very well, a series of courtyards in a, in a, an assemblage of about eight small buildings that are really designed at the scale of houses. And so when you look at the context, you see this is the main hospital, these kind of massive forms, and then the, the desire to, to break down the scale and work um, within this kind of residential neighborhood, which is adjacent. Um, also, the, then the importance of how spaces look out onto the courtyards, how views are framed, the kind of social activity and engagement that happens um, in these kinds of spaces. So here you can see those courtyards again. And that, um, I, you know, I would argue that at least in my experience in the United States with hospital design or a lot of medical facilities, it's just the sheer bulk of the buildings and the lack of access to external light and air and garden space that's um, one of the uh, kind of most urgent problems that we need to solve. I have a couple other examples of buildings that have not been built, but are, uh, one is under construction. This is a new children's hospital in Zurich which is a, a three-story building, so it's designed to be very low, but it's arranged, um, it's basically a giant rectangle, but has a lot of courtyards cut out of it. And so it's kind of like a Swiss cheese approach, uh, where within, this is a technical term in architecture, um, we also have cheese grater buildings, by the way, but um, where each of these courtyards has a different quality and different activities are happening, sometimes targeted towards staff, sometimes public spaces. Um, but it's a way to take what um, adjacencies that often have to happen in medical buildings and still allow light and air to enter those spaces um, in different ways. Um, and then just one more example from the this, this same architect. This is a, um, another hospital design called the Forest Hospital by um, Herzog and Demaran in Denmark. And here it's that same idea of creating external spaces, but rather than creating small singular ones, literally shaping the building to then create one essentially large courtyard which has smaller um, spaces uh, as part of it. So that as you walk through some of these spaces, you're seeing light on both sides, the outside area and the inside area. And I'm just showing these as kind of inspiration for how we can really rethink these buildings and landscapes. And we saw some great examples of garden spaces um, on the first day of our conference. And sometimes maybe space constraints don't allow that approach to courtyards, but it's also possible, um, this is another uh, project in Scandinavia, where these kind of massive bay windows in the dining area of this hospital or rehab center, uh, which you can kind of see in plan, allow people to really feel like they're projected out into the forest and um, not contained within this oppressive um, kind of volume. So I think as we've seen in these examples, every distinct space and place has its characteristic light, and, as, and light is often the quality that affects most directly our mood. Contemporary design and health research focuses on the value of natural daylight for human wellness. And there are, of course, extensive medical studies that have, have proven what architects have all, always known um, about the use of light. I just want to talk about a few more examples of light. Um, a lot of folks have been to Rome, to the Pantheon, I think. This has come up a few times. But, you know, natural light breathes life into architecture and connects the material world with cosmic dimensions. We know the Pantheon and the, the, the dynamic light created by the open oculus and the massive dome. In this way, architecture becomes a datum for reflecting the cyclical nature of time. A beam of light, isolated within architectural space, lingers on the surface of objects and evokes shadows from the background as light varies in intensity with the shifting of time and change of season. The appearance, the appearance of the objects themselves, even if they're uh, concrete walls, um, can change dramatically. So that, that idea of dynamism and constant change. And so I'm, I'm trying to show you these historic examples and then contemporary examples as a, a representation that the same principles can move forward to contemporary um, hospital design, for instance. Uh, this is work by Japanese architect Tadao Ando, who's a master of light. And this is, a, in this case, it's a private house. But this um, idea that forms can be relatively simple, but it's the light that really manifests that intangibility. I just want to um, talk for a minute about landscape. Landscape historian Mark Tribe discusses how a Japanese dry landscape, such as this Zen garden, we might call it, presents few forms or features 
or relationships between them upon which to attend. A sort of visual exhaustion sets in. In time, one may indeed find infinity within the garden's bounded space, or one may simply close one's eyes and exchange things physical for those metaphysical. So in this way, contemplation um, or mindfulness or potentially wellness is induced through the juxtaposition of finite human life and nature as an infinite force with its serene beauty. And I think beauty is something that we often, we're not really allowed to use that word anymore in architecture, um, often, but it's a really important concept, I think, for all of these these kinds of um, restorative spaces that we're thinking about creating today. So a dialogue between the built and the natural is really an important opportunity in design, even if the natural is not untamed nature, but perhaps purely the poetry of light and shadow. The last idea I wanted to talk about is this idea of um, creating uh, um, spaces for wellness by either reducing materiality and tactility to its absolute minimum or enhancing it. And we've seen a lot of rooms here during our trip that take that approach of really enhancing, um, stimulating our visual uh, senses in many ways. This is an example of of a a building in Kyoto, which just takes the very opposite approach, a simple rectangular volume, everything is white, Um, there's a sense of floating in this space. We can think of um, examples, but at the same time, we're able to be connected in a very carefully framed way to nature beyond. Uh, So this connection between the physical world and the metaphysical um, is important in a building like this. We could go back to Palladio and think about this idea too. This is Palladio San Giorgio Maggiore in um, Venezia, which is an example of also a very minimal material palette. It's not a richly uh, frescoed space. It's essentially gray and white, but it allows us to to understand and... and, um, engage with the volume and the shape uh, and the form of that space. Um, And we could think in just the opposite way. This is an example of a glass pavilion in London where um, it's all about dematerializing the walls and allowing the vegetation surrounding the building to give us that sense of interiority and connection. So for me, I guess these are examples that are really meant to um, talk about this kind of intense union between the natural and the constructed world. And then the last sense that I want to uh, mention mention is aural stimuli um, and how that's another strategy for creating particular kinds of spaces. So the quietness of a walled garden or a deep step well, uh, a place where we can be more fully present. And of course, one of my favorite examples of this argument is Peter Zumthor's thermal bath at Vols, which is thermal baths are a space of healing and wellness. Um, which heightens the senses as a means to reach the mind. And Peter Zumthor explains his intentions for this place. I just want to read a quote. Right from the start, there was a feeling for the mythical nature of the world of stone inside the mountain, for darkness and light, for the different sounds that water makes in stone surroundings, for warm stone and naked skin, for the ritual of bathing. So these intentions generate strong emotional, cognitive, and even physical responses in the um, inhabitants of these spaces. Interiors, in another way, are like large instruments. They collect sound, they amplify it, they transmit it elsewhere. It has to do with the shape of a particular room uh, and with the surfaces of the materials they contain and the way those materials have been applied. Uh, This is another example of that thermal bath project, and we could certainly think about the sound of this space or the space we visited last night in the Basilica. Peter Zumthor considers how human bodies find pleasure and protection in particular thermal conditions. So in this sense, temperature in a room is a physical but presumably psychological um, uh, condition as well. Think of how you feel, hopefully no one's feeling too sluggish right now in the space, but in a warm room you feel tired, you feel hot, you feel exhausted. So environments that minimize detrimental stimuli may offer silence that can slow the mind and also create a kind of corresponding um, inner silence. And there are certainly examples of many churches and temples around the world that offer an, a heightened auditory uh, experience with chanting, the ringing of bells, cows, um, and, and, and then the, the corresponding kind of inner silence that can even happen in that kind of intense um, oral environment. 
And then I guess the final one, and I'm, I, I'm not even going to try to do this one, is scent. Um, along with things like incense and candles and other smells, think this morning when we smelled the uh, croissants baking downstairs, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, how those smells are often elements brought into the space, but also how particular spaces have smells based on their materiality or their form, like the wine cellar that we visited yesterday, and that intense earthiness that we smelled and was so um, was such a visceral experience for all of us. So I hope these words and images have helped to explain how specific design strategies can heighten or quiet the senses to support well-being, maybe even contemplation. I just want to end with one quote uh, from Yanni Palasma, which um, I think sums it up uh, in many ways. The architectural experience is not just a visual or a sensorial encounter. A great work engages our entire being, altering our existential sense, our very sense of self, changing both the world and us. Thanks. Thanks.